welcome to Technically, a webinar series dedicated to the technical challenges of making the web accessible. This month, our presenter is Shell Little, the Mobile Accessibility Lead at Wells Fargo DS4B. Fantastic. Oh, and awesome. a reminder, Ed, to, so, reminder to everybody, um, sorry, um, if you have any questions, please throw them in the chat or the Q&A thing in, um, in Zoom, and we'll get to them at the end. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Michael, for that introduction. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about uh, mobile accessibility. So the title of my talk is Dark Adventures in Mobile Accessibility, because as Michael mentioned, mobile is a tricky space to work in. Uh, so if you are uh, excited to hear about mobile stuff, then you're in the right place. <laughs> so real quick before uh, we get into the introductions, uh, I'm going to go through my roadmap for the day. So start off with an intro. Going to move into the section called why. Uh, why is it so hard? Why is mobile accessibility this dark, scary space? Uh, from there, we can talk about the WCAG criterion, especially a focus on the 2.1 update. Then uh, the large bulk of my talk is going to be just practical examples, things I've seen in the wild, things I've read about, uh, things that kind of drive me crazy. So uh, that'll be kind of fun to go through. And then I'm going to wrap it up with the conclusion. Hopefully, I'll have enough time for some questions at the end. So um, as Michael said, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Zoom. So a little bit about me. My name is Shell Little. Uh, my gender pronouns are she and her. You can find me on Twitter at Shell E as in Elizabeth Little. Uh, that's where you'll find me and get a hold of me the easiest because my email is a black hole. So I'm going to just save everybody the time. <laughs> so feel free to uh, follow me, ping me, tweet at me. Uh, I enjoy interacting with people when it comes to my talks on Twitter. So if you are a Twitter human, feel free to uh, jump on there and make some comments and I will get back to you after my talk is done. Um, I work for Wells Fargo DS4B, so I work for Wells Fargo Wholesale, business to business, uh, bank to bank kind of thing. So if you bank with Wells Fargo personally, you probably do not and will not ever see the software that I work on. Um, so I work on the Accessible User Experience team. My uh, team lead is Gerard Cohen, who was on uh, technically a couple months ago himself. So myself, I'm the mobile and inclusive design lead for our team. I've been with Wells for a couple years now and uh, really got thrown into my mobile position, but uh, leaned into it and I'm really loving it, even though it is kind of hair pulling at times. Uh, so I'm living in Seattle and partnered and all of my children have tails and i um, very happy about that. <laughs> and then also just a side note, I'm just a really big video game enthusiast. So if you um, had a chance to see any of my stuff I had from the GA comp, um, it was pretty fun. So uh, yeah, moving on. So when it comes to mobile, there's this kind of misconception that I've heard in the wild, I've read about online, about the workaround of, oh, it doesn't work on our app, but it's fine because it works on the web. 
So I just want to set the record straight and say the workaround of it's accessible on desktop does not cut it anymore. We have long since passed that time where we are able to say, oh, just go to your computer. Um, just the way technology has evolved, the way that people are accessing the web, the way that people are interacting with your services, uh, it's, it's time to, you know, no longer use that scapegoat. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it was rapid and fast with the way the technology is moving, but if we can all kind of lean in and embrace that, I think the world will appreciate it, especially people in the mobile space. So why dark adventures? Why this kind of spooky, scary uh, analogy? Well, for me, I think of dark adventures and kind of, you know, lawlessness and uh, almost kind of dark waters. Because a lot of times there are questions that I have in mobile or people have in mobile and there are no answers. There are no standards for certain things where I have a big question and I have nobody to answer those for me. There's no standards for it. There's no best practice. And it's kind of exciting, but also kind of scary at the same time, uh, just because we've got uncharted territory. So just in general, we're talking about dark adventures, more just about the fact that we're waiting past the standards. We're you know, the safe zone and, you know, how I think about it, when you're encompassed in these standards, you're kind of in this like safe zone where you have tons of literature, tons of people doing it, people are talking about it online, you can read up on articles, uh, you can have a service like Tenant come in and help. But when you're in this mobile space, it's a lot harder to find those resources. So let's jump into our first section. Why is mobile accessibility so hard? There's plenty of reasons why mobile accessibility is really hard, but for me, I kind of broke it down into three major points. First of all, mobile isn't simple, and that's the dang truth there. HTML does not equal native code. They are different spaces, different beasts. And the WCAG standards and mobile kind of have a interesting <laughs> interaction with one another. So what even is mobile? When you think about mobile, we think about cell phones, typically. Uh, but do we think about tablets? Are we thinking about certain kinds of laptops these days? What really is mobile? So the W3C defines mobile as kind of two different categories, and, and I mostly agree. Uh, so we've got native applications, which a native application runs as a software application, uses devices, built-in features, such as cameras, microphones, location, et cetera. Um, you would locate those applications off of you know, the Google Play or uh, the iOS um, app store versus something which is a web app which runs in the browser and has a common code base across multiple platforms. And that does get messy because we've got different ways to access these things and they have different you know, features and blah, blah. So mobile browsers, um, are an interesting thing. You're able to access the web through these mobile browsers. So you're accessing web apps that are made to be consumed on computers, but you're accessing through your mobile browser. And oftentimes you're also accessing people's websites and information through another app. So uh, Pinterest is famous for this. Twitter also does it. Facebook does it. Where you're not launching your own personal browser, you're launching an internal still wrapped within their information browser. It's very interesting. So that definitely muddies the water there. And then also we've got uh, native applications. So we have native code. So code that's specifically written for iOS versus Android. And then we also have HTML RAC sites that are JavaScript bridge, uh, served up in a web app format, it's an application someone can download, but really they're just consuming web code that's wrapped and made to look pretty packaged for a uh, mobile device, quote, quote. So it gets complicated. There's a lot of different ways you can access this information. There's a lot of different ways that you're able to access the web. So when you're thinking about your users accessing your information, they could be coming from a mobile browser. They could be coming from 
a tablet that's running an OS that's still technically mobile, even though their screen is giant because of how tablets are these days. I personally run a Chromebook and I'm running web apps technically on my full-fledged Chromebook laptop. So basically TLDR, what we think of as mobile is just very broad. It, it means a lot of stuff. Back in the day, it didn't used to mean so much, but now with the way technology is expanded, it, it does it seem something different. Um, so next, uh, about the code. So HTML is not the same as native code. And I think anybody who knows anything about development totally understands that HTML is not the same as native code. Um, the way that we know HTML5, CSS, ARIA, doesn't really help you when we're talking about PHP, Python, native iOS. The things and trips, kicks, ugh, <laughs> tricks and tips that you know for building things accessibly in a web format, they kind of go out the window when it comes to uh, web, or excuse me, when it comes out to solid native code. So the way we design, develop, and even the way that we test for these native, specific native codes is totally different than the way that we do for HTML. So some examples real quick. So when we're talking about iOS specifically, iOS headings, for example, there's no hierarchy of headings. It's either a heading or it's not. You can't dictate, uh, you know, this is at H1 through H7. They are either headings or they are not. So when we're talking about things like Serving up an application to a smartwatch and someone saying, well, we have to have an H1 on this. The, the smartwatch has information on it. We, you know, we have to serve up H1. Well, if it's native iOS, there are no H1. So even when we're talking about testing or, you know, potentially accessing these specific native applications, we're even using different screen readers. And I'm not even talking, obviously, iOS having voiceover, but talkbacks versus using NVDA on or JAWS on the web. So you could be accessing the exact same code uh, if we're talking about, say, a JavaScript bridge wrapped web application. You could be accessing the exact same code with a totally different screen reader that has absolutely different behavior, uh, different orientation. It announces things differently. So if you're thinking about it as the way you would with JAWS and VDA for an Android-based app, talkbacks is different. So you can't think of them the exact same. Uh, zooming and enlarging text. So obviously when we're on a web, control plus, we zoom in, we expand our pages, we make text bigger. But when it comes to native code, we're doing away with pinch to zoom. I, I personally would love to see the death of pinch to zoom myself. So what we're doing now is we're relying heavily on the OS to handle the text size. So the user themselves can go into the accessibility settings, change how big they want their font, and then the code should, you know, if done appropriately, should respond as is needed. So the way that we even zoom things and the way that we would build a native application, if you have a small box with content in it, you better code it in a way that if the text gets blown up 200%, that nothing's going to break. It doesn't pop outside of the box. It needs to be made in a way knowing that that text could grow quite a bit. And then hover states. If, if you're expecting your users who are, say, potentially accessing a, a news site to hunt down links because, you know, you oh, I have a hover state, technically that passes, you know, if you've got your contrast up high enough that it's not color alone, you can't expect your users to be able to hunt for underlines on links because there really is no such thing as hover states when it comes to mobile. And the big thing is, in most situations, you cannot open the code up and see what's going on. You have to rely on testing tools to tell you the story. So I'm not able to open up the code inspector and check things out when we're talking about 100% native code. I can't simply ask. Uh, my browser, what the heck's going on? I have to run screen readers over it. I have to um, use my best judgment. I have to do research and read into what's going on if it's iOS versus Android. And that right there is difficult, especially when we're talking about UAT environments. Maybe you don't have access to the code. Maybe your development for your specifically for your native stuff, maybe it's done in a different party. Maybe it's a third party company doing it for you and you don't have access to that. So it, it can be very difficult. 
Um, last but not least, the WCAG 2.0 was not written for mobile. Now, obviously, it's a, a great improvement from uh, version one, a lot more prescriptive, made to be broad, made to encompass as many types of technology as it could. But WCAG 2.0 came out in 2008. And for some context, for those of us who have to think back to 2008, the RIM BlackBerry Bold, that was like the sexy new cell phone, the best-selling phone. Everybody was talking about it in 2008. So if that's the kind of phone we were talking about, there's no way the WCAG standards could have had any, you know, any knowledge of what was about to come, what cell phones were about to start looking like, what even web applications, what even apps were about to look like. Because in 2008 is when Facebook's mobile site, not even their application launched. Uh, the, Facebook, the Facebook application launched in 2009. So the year that the WCAG standards came out was the first year that people have, were able to access Facebook just alone on a phone. So that adds a lot of context when we're saying, I'm looking for standards for something super complicated in a, you know, a double modal pattern that should never exist. And uh, we also have it wrapped in a JavaScript bridge on top of the fact that when I tap this button, I'm sent to a 100% native page. What do we do about, you know, back button experience? There's no way the WCAG standards could have been equipped for that. Thankfully, you know, we've got 2.1, so let's move into section number two, and let's talk about uh, the update to WCAG 2.1 and how that applies to mobile. So WCAG 2.1 has had several uh, mobile-related updates, which was awesome to see. Uh, I followed the update very closely, uh, had a couple heartbreak moments with a couple uh, shifts to AAA. Does make sense, but, you know. You guys, you know, so a lot of people are watching the uh, March Madness. You know, I was watching the WCAG standards. <laughs> oh, so while there's a, there's plenty of standards, I can't remember exactly how many are A and AA. I think it's 12 uh, standards, but I'm just going to highlight a couple. I have five on the screen. I think I have five. Yes, I have five. <laughs> uh, so I have orientation, pointer gestures, motion, actuation, target size, and reflow. So first things first, let's talk about orientation. Basically, orientation says, do not restrict the view of the content to a single display orientation, such as portrait or landscape. Basically, allow your users to choose their own adventure when it comes to if they want them to be in portrait or if they want it to be in landscape. Now, if you've already read through 2.1 and you're super well aware, this is just going to be a review for you. So orientation is super important because this criterion came to exist because people uh, with motion, let's see, there's three different types of user groups who really rely heavily on this one, but uh, people with physical disabilities, especially people who have mounted devices, they have it in either landscape or portrait. And to ask the, that user to constantly switch the orientation of their phone is unreasonable. Now, there are some exceptions. Obviously, certain things require you to be in one mode or the other. Uh, specifically, the standards, uh, they say a keyboard application where you can play the keyboard. It wouldn't make sense to have that work in uh, a portrait mode. So, orientation is super important to think about when we're talking about uh, working in the mobile space because a lot of times that doubles the wireframes for when you're building something. So, if you're not thinking about creating things and optimizing them for, uh, you know, typically would be for landscape mode. If you're not thinking about that, you're missing out on a really big chunk of work. Now, yes, technically, I think they're appropriately responsive. You could probably get away with it. But a lot of times it does require some thinking and some planning ahead, which would require wireframing. So pointer gestures, this one is involving uh, fingers touching things or maybe things that mimic stylus pens, um, different types of touch targets. So uh, pointer gestures, multi-point or path-based gestures can be used with a single pointer. So a big example people talked about a lot with this is maps. So uh, having to use multiple fingers to pinch and zoom and pull in and out, uh, potentially having to drag in certain paths. Now there are plenty of um, 
different workarounds and exceptions. Some examples would be games. Um, I can think of like Fruit Ninja was a big one that people talked about. You're obviously expected to swipe your finger in a certain direction, and without having that, the game becomes uh, kind of unraveled, but I would be really interested to have accessibility conversations about how to make that game accessible. Um, that's another talk. <laughs> but in general, you just have to be able to lean on your UI to be able to do these things. So, you know, Google Maps, they have a plus and minus uh, zoom in buttons. You don't have to pinch and zoom. Pointer gestures is really important. When we're talking about legacy pages, which we will talk about in a little bit. When things can't or aren't currently made to appropriately reflow, we can't force users to have to be able to pinch and zoom and pinch and zoom. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, I want to, I would love for pinch and zoom to stop existing, so it can be a problem. For motion actuation, we're talking about interactions that use device motion. Uh, we need to make sure that those can also be done through the UI. So a great example, I remember when Facebook came out with 3D videos and I was on a plane and I looked just, oh, I was so frustrated because I was like, I look like an idiot waving my phone around on a plane full of people trying to watch them, I don't know, concert of some sort and trying to get the 360 experience. <laughs> and eventually after they released it because of pushback, they, you know, there was a way to swipe back and forth. And if it's not Facebook that didn't come out with it originally, um, I can't remember, there was another company that had was like images where you're able to slide back and forth. I know panoramas. So that's a perfect example. Just allow your users to be able to, you know, swipe or put one finger, have arrows left and right. They don't have to wave their phone around because not everybody has that ability. Target size. Now, oh my gosh, I can hear the cries. But show, touch target size is AAA. I know, and I don't really care that much. <laughs> but let's talk about it. So actionable items must be 44 by 44 CSS pixels. Not too crazy. So the reason why touch target size is triple A is because there are certain things that are actionable items that it just is not practical for them to be 44 by 44 or any sort of 96 of any kind. So an example of that would be links, you know, in a sentence, you can't make those ginormous. That doesn't even make any sense. Um, it's also difficult because if you have two different ways, like multiple ways to access something, one could, only one of them has to meet it. So that's pretty good. But when we're talking about it being AAA, understandable, maybe we can just talk about icons or you know, buttons that are not X, Y, and Z variables. Because when we're talking about standards, both Apple and Google already have best practice standards of 48 by 48. So if you're following the Apple and Google standards, then you've already passed the uh, expected standards of uh, touch target size. So the human interaction, human interface guidelines from Apple recommends the 44 by 44, um, and then the Android material design guidelines is 44, excuse me, 48 by 48, and then um, they have a recommendation of seven to 10 millimeters uh, in size. So when we're talking about, you know, login buttons, cancel buttons, sign out buttons, that's pretty practical. Uh, having these itty bitty, teeny tiny little buttons when you're coming from web, going over to, you know, maybe we're on a browser, those buttons are tiny and that gets really difficult. And last but not least, reflow. Code should be responsive. It's pretty simple. Uh, make sure content doesn't require scrolling in two dimensions. So if you have a page that isn't responsive and you have, you know, people scrolling left and right, up and down, that doesn't pass reflow. Um, so even with the updates, mobile accessibility is still a lawless wasteland. And that is because mobile accessibility is so difficult. There are so many just nitty gritty, interesting interactions that, you know, it's just so hard to write standards for. So it's not the fact that the WCAG standards aren't good or they're not enough. It's because mobile is really difficult. And it's difficult to write standards for. So let's talk about a scenario real quick in the terms of responsive. So the rule being content must be responsive. So it must, you know, reflow. It must have appropriate breakpoints. The issue I, you know, I was talking about earlier, old legacy content does not wrap and break in mobile. I see that a lot in government. I see that a lot in higher education. And I see that a lot in older companies. You have websites, they, they're beautiful, they work, but they are not responsive. And if they're responsive, they're not responsive down to the breakpoint of a cell phone. That's a big issue. 
when we're talking about it not being responsive, we're breaking A, reflow, which is no 2D scrolling with an exception, with obviously with exceptions such as tables, pictures, maps, diagrams, you know, there's plenty of examples. Um, but that's the 400% point gesture. So your users should not be forced to pinch and zoom. So maybe if you're able to get away with a double tap zoom, you know, maybe it can work out. Then we also have uh, the 2.0 standard of the resize text. So that's being able to zoom text to 200%. So if it's not even responsive, it's obviously not going to listen to what the OS has to say about uh, changing text size. And then likely if your old legacy content isn't responsive, it probably will not work uh, in changing orientation or if it does, it, you know, it's just another view of the same giant website that people are scrolling around on. So, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of fails right there. Um, just for a, a, you know, a homepage that doesn't respond and someone's accessing it through their mobile browser. So you have two choices, basically, make the page responsive or create a mobile version. Like, good luck. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot to do, especially when we're talking about legacy pages when there's just, you know, a ton of them. Even if you have a roadmap to update, it's still a lot of content. And that's, that's very difficult. And when we're talking about just making willy-nilly applications, users want to access functionality they have on the web with mobile, and they want them similar, if not the exact same. If you want to look at the um, iPhone store or the Google Play store, if you want to find, you know, really, really angry users, look for websites that have apps that do not have the same experience, do not have the same functionality. That's when you get angry users. So we're not even talking necessarily specifically about accessibility. Having differentiation between the two different uh, experiences, that's just not, nobody wants that anyway. So your best bet is to make things just responsive, make them uh, break appropriately, uh, code responsibly, as I've been told, <laughs> and, uh, you know, remediate them in that way, because sometimes just throwing native code at something is, is not the answer. So let's move into section three. This is the last major section. Let's just talk about some practical examples. Now, before I get into this, I will say um, I am not a developer. That is not my strong suit. Um, I personally, <laughs> I'm neurodivergent myself, so um, the programming that I do is limited at best. So if anybody has any incredibly technical questions, I'm going to send you to Google or maybe someone else. But a lot of my experiences have to come with designing for accessibility and designing in mobile spaces, but also I do have some technical know-how as well. I just wanted to preface that just so nobody is expecting some big sexy page of code or anything. So first thing we're going to talk about would be camera functions. Now camera functions, we can talk about, I kind of thought about two different things, working in banking, biometrics, so that could be something like Face ID. Wells Fargo has its own internal um, Face ID, face recognition. Uh, you can Google it. There's videos up showing what it looks like and how it behaves on the YouTube. So, you know, having something that has camera functions or something like iPrint, Face IDs, those different types of uh, different functionalities, you get the picture. And then in banking, I know a lot of people love the fact that they're able to take pictures of their checks and send them in. Um, I bank with several banks myself, and they all have that functionality. There's also receipt capturing uh, for business trips, for expenses, but also for a lot of the, I don't want to say money-saving apps, but uh, financial apps that help you balance budgets and blah, blah. They have, um, some of them have receipt capture as well to help you balance your checkbook. Uh, so on and so forth. But basically anything that's forcing your camera to be used, uh, it could be scanning a ticket, a code, maybe a QR code. So basically when it comes to camera functionality, from my experience, what I have found from remediating different types of camera functionalities, from reading about them, uh, from hearing from coworkers and um, people on the interwebs is number one, information is key. So if it's being displayed to your user, if something is happening and your user needs to know about it, it also has to be read by a screen reader. Any kind of tips, tricks, hints, anything that's being 
inform, move your camera closer, move your camera further away, it's too dark, it's too bright, that kind of content, as long as it's being displayed in a way that is, you know, appropriately can be seen by people who have a vision related disabilities, and also it can be accessed by a screen reader, that kind of information is crucial. Anything about moving your camera closer, moving it further away for someone who's sighted, it is monumentally more important to a screen reader user. And screen reader users can use cameras successfully if we do our jobs right, if we plan ahead, if we make sure these experiences are made with them in mind. So information is key. Simple is better. So when it comes to things like cropping images or forcing users to take things at certain orientations, for example, the, the simpler you can make the cap camera functions, the better. Not too complicated. So I know, for example, um, some check check uh, picture things require you to crop. Some don't. Now, if you're some users can't crop, so if they can't crop, what happens if they don't? Uh, that kind of information. So if you can make it simple for them, then do. And then when it comes to being simple, also automation. Simple better. So we're talking about auto capture images. So it takes the picture for you. It also has auto flash, and then um, anything basically auto, so auto focus, auto flash, if you're able to automate things and take burden off of the user when it comes to camera functions, that's great. You should do that. <laughs> and then obviously give them options because sometimes auto capture is not good. If someone has a physical disability, uh, maybe it takes them a little bit longer and the auto capture might be a barrier for them. So give, give people options if they can't get an if they can't get a good photograph in one way, allow them to try doing it manually. I know uh, BECU app uh, does that specifically, where if you fail too many times, they give you the option to just do it yourself, which um, is appreciated. Right, moving on, we're gonna talk about moving content. So um, I hopefully will get my slides up eventually, but at CSUN I gave a presentation on pause, stop, hide, and kind of what happened to pause, stop, hide. <laughs> So as somebody with an attention-related disability, moving content is a big deal. Um, we're talking about moving content. Uh, it's funny, I'm like gonna try to sum up my talk, <laughs> our, like our talk in one slide, but I'll try to do my best. So we're talking about moving content. We've got micro interactions, moving ads, and timers, takers, scrollers. So when it comes to mobile, these things get exacerbated because the screens are so little. So something that's moving, now is taking up much more real estate on a phone screen. So these moving, moving content can be so much more intrusive, especially when we're talking about moving ads and mobile, which I will get into right now. So first point I have is pause, stop, hide. You there? Hello. <laughs> so apparently, collectively, everybody has ignored that we have a criterion called pause, stop, hide. Content that lasts for longer than five seconds must be able to be paused, stop, or hidden. And that includes ads, for sure. <laughs> so ad blocker, totally a thing. But if I'm accessing a website, say I'm on Twitter and I select a link and it sends me to a, uh, you know, some sort of journalism site, you bet your bottom dollar there's going to be 8,000 moving ads on that that I have no control over. I am unable to close, move away from. Now, in my talk, I gave, I had a slide that said, your users shouldn't be hackers. They shouldn't have to be hackers to use your software. So yes, there are 6,000 different workarounds, but in reality, shouldn't we just follow the standard for cost off hide? So micro interactions are something that uh, can be a barrier. I had a really big issue with an autocomplete feature that Google had implemented. So basically on Gmail, as you're typing, it suggests the rest of your sentence and it suggests that for you in line with what you're typing versus if you're typing in a um, in the bar above a search, it, you have drop down options and to have it fill in next to you, it's a micro interaction. Technically, it's not a fail um, for the standards, but boy oh boy, was that a barrier, incredible barrier. And there are plenty of little micro interactions like that, that yeah, technically they pass, but they are a really big problem, especially with how much people love micro interactions. And don't get me wrong, some micro interactions are incredibly important. Um, a, hey, I'm over here, 
can be really important, but also, hey, a button jiggling saying I'm over here, if it doesn't stop, can end the task. So in iOS, there is a function to reduce motion. So is reduce motion enabled? One word, or no spaces. Um, you are able to code things to have a reduced motion for your users. I'm talking about parallax scrolling, things that cause uh, nausea or dizziness. Um, it also helps with things, you know, like I was saying, the micro interactions. But is reduced motion enabled isn't really general practice, and I wish it was. But the sad thing is, I personally, with an attention related disability who finds moving content to be a barrier, I don't use iOS, I'm an Android user, so uh, the is reduced motion enabled sounds great, but I'll never benefit from it. But in general, you know, thinking about these types of things, because native is so different than HTML, something like is reduced motion, if that was used more, we could break down a lot of barriers for people with disabilities like mine. Um, and then another really big takeaway for moving content, do not tie data saving to if I want moving content on or off. Um, in my presentation, I had an example from Pinterest. The only way I was able to turn off autoplay, which is an incredible barrier for me, was if I had, it was specifically to save when I wasn't on Wi-Fi. So I'm unable to sit in my home on Wi-Fi and enjoy autoplay being off because to the developers, it's only a data saving technique. They are not thinking beyond the data saving and thinking about how moving content is a barrier. Now, technically, technically, these all pass the standard because they autoplay has five seconds to do its thing, first of all. Second of all, if I can pause it, which a lot of times you are able to pause like moving video ads on Pinterest and, and different things like that, you're able to pause it technically or close it. So it's not a fail but at the same time, it's still a barrier. So having access to reducing the amount of autoplaying features uh, is really great. Twitter and LinkedIn are two great examples that you're just able to toggle it off. I don't want things to autoplay. That's GIF, that's videos, that's um, anything moving basically. I'm able to toggle that off. That's a great feature. So if, that, if you do have a mobile app and you do have content that autoplays, I highly recommend thinking about creating a toggle because I myself find that to be, depending on how many spoons I have for the day, that can be make or break for me when it comes to tasks. Okay, so next is back button behavior. This one is near and dear to my heart. I have a lot of feelings about it. <laughs> so when we're talking about a back behavior, there's a lot of different backs when we're talking about a back button. So we've got browser back. We have the OS back, like a hard back, and then we also have a built-in native back. That's three back buttons. That's a lot of different behaviors. So when it comes to specifically, let's talk about, say, a native back. If you have a native back on the upper, say, upper left-hand corner of your window on a native, 100% native page, that back button is a dot back it will send users back to one page. Now, say you're at the end of a flow and a user just submitted, they were given their, are you sure you want to submit screen? They have agreed and said yes, and they've moved to the congratulations. The thing that you want to do is totally done, high five. They're on that screen. What does back mean there? If they were to go dot back, you're going to send them to either an error or to accidentally resend what they had sent. And if we're talking maybe in banking, that could be another payment. If we're talking about buying something, maybe like movie tickets or a concert ticket, that could be buying accidentally double tickets. So a lot of times the, the way to handle it is to just get rid of the back or to disable the hard back. But if you have a button in the upper left-hand corner that says back on every screen, except for the one that will technically navigate your user to an error, that's a consistent navigation fail because the navigation item is not consistently located and consistently available on every page. So you're unable to disable the hardback to just be a scapegoat. <laughs> it's something that we can absolutely design around. 
So how we design around that and how people have designed around that is to ask yourself, what does back mean? So my users at the end of a flow, what, where do they actually want to go if they want to go back? And a lot of times it's back home. It's back to the beginning of the flow. Maybe it's a flow that they can do more than once. Maybe it's a, you know, an order form or something that they could repeat multiple times and go through the process multiple times. Uh, you know, maybe they're setting up an account. It could be a thousand things. So when you give user congratulations, you're done. That could mean something other than I want to go back one page. So ask yourself, what does back mean? What does my user want in this experience? Because when you're, when you're, uh, Disabling a hard back, so we're talking about the Android hard back. When you're disabling that, what if a user is in the exact same flow, but they're on the web? Are you going to be able to disable the back button on the browser? Or maybe are we just going to have to design around it? So because there are so many different experiences with a back button, we have to be able to design around them, especially when we've got an OS or an iOS that has no hardback, it relies heavily on a native back versus a hardback. So say you did get rid of your native back, but you did not get rid of your, or disable the hardback, right there you've got two different inconsistent experiences. So back buttons are pretty complicated, but I will recommend just ask yourself what your user wants because getting rid of a back behavior because it will, because that back will send them to an error is, is not the answer. Uh, Toolkit. This is a quick one because it obviously it's pretty simple. So tooltips can be really important. Hint information. They can contain help content. They can contain identifying information. But uh, toolkits don't really work on mobile. <laughs> they are not information you can really access. And the problem with that is that tooltips are something that would be even more useful when we're looking at a mobile space. Because we have less real estate, getting rid of labels, moving away from labeling things appropriately, uh, from identifying and differentiating between different icons, items, you know, actionable things is really popular. How can we save space, get rid of the label, let the user try to figure out what that means? And that kind of experience is really difficult. Now, technically, there we go again, if you're, say we're talking about a JavaScript bridge wrap native experience onto an app, so we're, it's HTML code, it has a, it has a tooltip on it. Technically, that does pass the standard, but on a mobile device, if somebody who's sighted, that doesn't really help them. So if you are a non-sighted user and you're using a screen reader and you roll over that icon, item, button, blah, blah, you will get the tooltip information. That information will be read to you. Everything will be great. But if you're a sighted user with a cognitive disability, for example, a, a chevron or a button uh, that says one with no label next to it doesn't really mean anything or an ambiguous like up arrow with a two on it. Like what does that even mean? So small, arc, small icons that even though they're different, even though they pass color contrast, it's still not enough. We can't just do away with labels. So we have to find a way to work labels back into the way that we differentiate buttons. Now, there are some things that obviously have transcended labels, such as a hamburger, uh, a hamburger menu. There's also the, uh, the triple one, two, three, up and down um, stoplight menu that just means more. There are certain icons, obviously, that have transcended. But in general, we can't just do away with labels left and right. Um, and then, yeah, so tooltips, super important, but again, it's kind of a funky experience. And, you know, this isn't prescriptive, like maybe there are examples where it doesn't matter or if it's good to go, but in general, you can't rely on that kind of background information if you have a set of users who don't have access to that information. Okay, um, next, and I think we're getting close to the end, uh, hidden page titles. So page titles versus H1. The fact that they're hidden and the fact that they help with wayfinding. So this is kind of more for iOS because as mentioned previously, there is really no way to do an H1, which is heading or not heading. So page titles are really important on a native page. And sometimes page titles, there's really no 
place to put it. There's no way to make the big, broad, sexy, this is the H1. Sometimes pages are a little more convoluted. For example, a page that is a success page. Doesn't really gonna have anything on it other than maybe a success notification or an icon or an image. So a way to do that is to use a set title at and then for example, home or whatever you need. Um, I spend a lot of time at work um, working with our content writers to determine what is the best page title for a uh, particular native page. So they're hidden obviously because it's a page title. Um, just trying to add extra context for non-sighted users. And what's really important about making sure that every page has a unique page title is wayfinding. And it's obviously the way that we would do it on the web. It just needs to be done also on mobile. People really forget about that. Um, if we're thinking about things in terms of H1, uh, it's easy to forget about things like page titles, but for iOS, the H1, they don't, they're not really gonna help you out. So more of a don't forget than anything else, obviously not groundbreaking. And uh, I think this is my last one. We'll see. Uh, navigation. So just kind of something interesting. This is not prescriptive or telling anybody what to do. This is just something that I find incredibly interesting. So navigation. We're talking about navigation. I'm talking about like swipe order. So focus in the DOM, focus order, meaningful sequence, and then keyword behavior. So something that I found fascinating. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, then Yahoo, just becoming Oak, their uh, accessibility team. And they told a story about, um, they do really fantastic accessible uh, accessibility user experience testing. And uh, we were told a story, my team and I, about a time they had, were so proud going into doing user testing. They had, they had just really felt like they had covered everything. They had users with vision related disabilities and they just felt ready to rock. And the guy sat down and he whipped out a Bluetooth keyboard and the whole room went silent. And this guy used their app with a Bluetooth keyboard and it broke everything. Because people do use Bluetooth keyboards. It's definitely a thing. Again, when I was speaking about the fact that I use a Chromebook, I have a keyboard attached. I'm technically using some native app. So if I tab through, what happens? A big thing I find with uh, focus order and meaningful sequence when it comes to native stuff is it's fascinating for me because the focus can get lost so easily behind modals, behind pop-ups, behind when you have multiple uh, pages open. So say you open one window from the other and you're in a native app and it does support that behavior, um, getting lost or if you swipe up too far, you're still looking at page one but if you, you know, say you swipe down too far, you're on page one, technically you're focused on page two, but it's not visible. Uh, just kind of really interesting stuff like that. So if we only think about native in terms of using screen readers and not thinking about the fact that sometimes people without uh, keyboards, it, it's kind of an extra bold. Um, an interesting story was about, about skip links. So if a skip link does not show visibly, obviously that's an accessibility violation. When you're thinking about native, it's like, well, you know, if it's announced to the screen reader user, like that's kind of the main user who is going to need a skip link in this regard. Pardon uh, my animals in the background making noise. Um, but that's the main user who's going to want this will be a screen reader user and, and it doesn't have to be shown visibly. But then if somebody whips out a Bluetooth keyboard and the skip link isn't visible, they're not going to hear that announcement. So they're going to miss out. So it's kind of, that just kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, people use Bluetooth keyboards with cell phones. This is, this is incredible. So uh, more anecdotal than anything else. Okay, so wrapping up, because we are short on time. In conclusion, uh, when it comes to making accessible design uh, decisions, we cannot wait for the walk egg standards to catch up. And that's not because, again, it's not because the standards aren't good enough, it's not because they uh, are slow, it's because making standards for web is, or excuse me, for mobile is really, really hard. Uh, it's really hard to find a standard that can be easily testable and have a repeatable, testable way. So we have to move beyond into the dark water and we have to determine best practice standards for things like back button, for things like what do you do when things technically have tool tips but really they're not visible and it's a problem but it's not a violation. We have to figure out ways to work beyond the standards 
to create experiences for people, you know, like me who have attention related disabilities. Yes, technically it passes the WCAG standards, but the fact that I can't read articles because I'm bombarded with moving ads is a problem. Next, mobile accessibility is hard because the lines between web and mobile are way too blurred at this point. We're serving up HTML code wrapped up. We're accessing special mobile sites via browser. People are gonna access your content in ways that you never dreamed of. They're gonna be on an Xbox surfing the web. I'm having a really hard time with Netflix on my smart TV. You know, it's the way that we access technology is way beyond cell phones and computers. We've got tablets, we've got smart watches, we have smart televisions. There's thousands of different ways that we're able to access content. So if we're thinking very much web mobile, that's just not the way to think about it anymore. It's muddy, it's dark, it's scary, and we're all in it together. <laughs> uh, when code truly is native, it must be treated with a different approach than web code. Simple, made that point quite a few times. If, you, if you're going into, say, even testing for accessibility violations, in mobile and you're looking for exactly what you look for in the web, you're gonna have a bad time. Perfect example that I, I made a bunch of times was H1s and headings. It's just a different experience. Um, I think this is the last one, yes. Mobile accessibility is going to take time, creativity and input from persons with disabilities. I will repeat that, input from persons with disabilities to get right. It's gonna take time. But there are awesome companies doing awesome things when it comes to accessibility where there are really no standards. For example, people are able to take selfies with iOS because of the way that they audio describe, because of the way that uh, the phone communicates to the user. People who are blind are able to take selfies, and that's amazing. Things like that, the way, these creative, innovative ways, and I'm not an iOS fangirl myself, but I do absolutely recognize that there are some really great things happening. Um, speech to text technology is changing my life. It's amazing the way that we're using smart devices. These are, these are going places. And at Tucson, I have the opportunity to talk to people who are creating some of those devices. And the way that they have worked alongside persons with disabilities is fantastic. So there are really great things happening. It's not all <laughs> doom and gloom. There's really good stuff going on. So, but it's just going to take a little bit beyond the standards. It's going to take, you know, brainstorming and making a lot of mistakes first before we get the right answers. Again, um, my name is Shell, and you can find me at Shell E is an Elizabeth Little on Twitter. And I did put my email address up there, but I will not read it aloud because I do not support anybody emailing me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> LinkedIn might be better. But thank you guys for your time, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Shell. Um, well, looks like we've got. Um, no, but it's just a great stuff. I see. Uh, you really spoke to uh, Mallory's soul. She was uh, in the chat. She was cheerleading you quite a bit. It was almost like a. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> it was almost like a, a, a woman at a Black Southern Baptist church screaming, "Preach on, brother!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> During. I'll uh, have to look at that. I can't see it right now. <laughs> Ah, but yeah, it looks like um, anybody have any questions? Oh, we're just getting some great positive comments. Oh, somebody may have a question. Okay. I saw some pings and I was like, oh, people are going to have lots of questions. But <laughs> I, I'm glad that I, I'm glad I got Mallory cheering in the in the chat. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, what speech or what speech to text program do you use if you use any? Uh, so for speech to text. So um, in my free time, I stream on Mixer, plug for Mixer. Um, I rely heavily on the Google Speech-to-Text API. Um, so anything built into my device, uh, when it comes to searching, when it comes to um, you know, typing, texting. Uh, and I gave a talk actually and in Toronto at the um, A11YTO comp. And an example that I used there was the fact that Pinterest does not have, it does not allow me to use my voice to text um, feature in their search is a really huge barrier for me. So if anybody knows anybody at Pinterest, let me know. 
um, because I rely heavily because of my dyslexia, I rely really heavily on a speech to text to make sure that uh, when I'm looking up recipes, I'm not looking up just, you know, garbage yeah. words instead. <laughs> Um, is there any place you would suggest develop developers go to learn more about mobile techniques? Uh, yeah, so personally, I have, yeah, I have consumed a lot of the content from TPG. They have an iOS guide and a uh, Android guide, and I highly recommend those two pieces of literature. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if they're paid or not, so that might not be incredibly beneficial, but it is worth it to me, um, you know, as a non-developer especially with iOS, I had to spec a whole project um, to basically break down every element of a project to deliver to the developers. And with using the TPG guides, I was able to uh, really learn a ton and successfully communicate uh, the accessibility needs to our developers. Okay, and um, Pamela points out that, for instance, like a library catalog may have extensive info on the desktop version, but uh, for mobile, the details are usually significantly scaled back. That actually, I, I know that very well as a former librarian myself. Um, would that be considered mm -hmm. a, like, a, like a violation? Because um, she always thought that scaled down content for mobile was more accessible and not necessarily less. Um, are you referring, when, when you're talking about scaled down information, are you talking about like, say like a description on a book is, has less content? Yeah, that, that, that generally happens. Um, it also might have, it might pull off information. Oh, I'm trying to think here. It's been a while since I've looked at a mobile catalog. Um, it may have less information, but not necessarily vital. Like on, on, mm -hmm. a, mobile, on a mobile catalog, it may just have, you know, the, maybe a picture of the book or the title of the book and where it is and the mm -hmm. call number and whatnot. And maybe, um, the availability across branches if there are branches as opposed to on, gotcha. a, on a regular web it may have a full-on description it may have reviews of the book and, and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing gotcha okay yes so like optimizing stuff is really correct you don't want to bombard time that's what expandable content sections are for and that's what uh, click here to learn more or uh, expand is for so you know maybe minimizing information that you're given up front but if the user really wants to find that extra info it shouldn't be uh on a different platform it should be maybe behind a you know uh, an, maybe pop up a window that gives you all that information mm -hmm. and the user's able to scroll through um but if you are if we're talking about like pulling out the kind of fluffy stuff and leaving the really important content i i see no problem in that as long as the content would be considered parallel and uh, equal in you know what a user would get out Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pamela just pointed out that maybe a, a, a title may have 15 subject tags and 10 authors on a desktop and on mobile that may mm -hmm. just have the first three subject tabs and the first two tags and the first two, um, two authors. So that would, gotcha. that, that, that may not be as successful because that's, yeah. And that's where, that, that would yeah, be that's where I would say, final stuff. Yeah, correct. That's where, you know, that's where I would say, like, um, having a dot, 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 or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I said, click here to, or tap here to um, read more would be really important in that situation. All right. Have you heard of uh, hooking up phones to laptops to see the code? Uh, Mallory's heard of people hooking up iPhones and Mac to Macs and viewing in Safari and hooking up Androids and viewing the source in Chrome. I have heard of it. I have not had the experience to do it myself, nor have I seen it in person, but it does sound super interesting to me. Cool. Um, uh, John Gibbons points out that TPG's um, testing guides are freely downloadable. So go check out. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and then one, yeah. final, we have one final question for you as we're nearing the end of our time. Um, Chris Frey has a question about iOS headings. Uh, he audits a lot of interfaces that use a ton of bold text to delineate categories, uh, such as dates with several child elements under those dates. But in some screens, there are a week's worth of items, so we're looking at a minimum of seven headings on a small screen, on, on, on small screen real estate. Uh, is there a soft rule of thumb when considering how many headings are appropriate, or when developers should consider reorganizing the information? Uh, yeah. So first of all, hi, Chris Fry. <laughs> um, 
I'm not sure I fully understood. Let me let me look through the question one more time. Um, so basically, just, the question is: there's just too much content, basically. Yeah, yeah. If if, if, yeah, if, if you're if you're hitting seven headings, that's that's quite a bit. And it's just: is there a soft rule that you follow that be like, hey, maybe we should cut it off here or go back to the drawing board and reorganization? Yeah, I think if we're talking about so a shared code base, so maybe it's just like a uh, you know, a web-based thing wrapped into or, you know, broken down to a mobile device size. If it's not working at a mobile device size because there's too much content, because it's too cluttered, then honestly, it probably sounds like that would be a great reason to reorganize because if there's that much content and some of it's unnecessary, users who are, you know, potentially screen reader users who are, are accessing it on the web are going to find it just as cumbersome as somebody who would be doing it on, the, on mobile. Um, so just reorganizing and kind of minimizing content because when we optimize for mobile, we're optimizing all experiences, um, just getting rid of extra clutter, getting rid of extra, you know, unnecessary like paths that loop. Um, I think that I've found that when we've redone old legacy stuff and just cleaned out the content and kind of like gave it a facelift that it just, it makes experiences better all over. Okay. Um. I think that was it. Um, well, PJ has a quick question. Where should we go before presentations to read about the upcoming topic? Well, you can go to uh, technically.org. That's T-E-C-H-N-I-C-A-1-1-Y.org. Um, we usually have all the uh, bio information and topic information about two weeks before, or at least two weeks before the next talk, which speaking of which, our next uh, next month, we'll have Michelle Williams who's a senior UX researcher for accessibility at Pearson, and she'll be on to discuss what's really needed to conduct accessibility user research and how that generally involves having an accessible ecosystem uh, to work with. Uh, that will be on May, May 1st. Oh, it's on May Day. Wow. Uh, so instead of dancing around the Maypole with Lord Summer Isle and burning a wicker man that may or may not have Nicolas Cage in it, uh, come listen to Michelle Williams here on Technically. Uh, it's going to be on May 1st at 11 a.m. And if you missed anything, uh, you can always keep an eye out on Tenon's YouTube channel for this month's webisode upload in a few days. Uh, we'll, of course, let you know via the social media platforms when it's available. Or you can always just subscribe to the channel on YouTube to get automatic notifications. And with that, I'd like to thank Shell again for her excellent presentation and all of you for joining us today. And we'll see you all next month. Thank you.